You know, I've been called a lot of names in my lifetime, but one name I have never been called is a zealot. How about you? Well, in this episode of the Midweek Refill, we're going to be talking about Simon the Zealot from Zealotry to Redemption. This is part 11 of our series on Lessons from the Twelve Disciples. I'm Bishop A. Reginald Littman, and you're watching the Midweek Refill. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I'm your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman, Senior Pastor of the New Mountaintop Church, and I am excited to welcome you to part 11 of our series on Lessons from the Twelve Disciples. Be sure to check the description box below for a free PDF handout. That's right, it is free 99 Grab it while supplies last. We want you to get it because I want you to share it with your friends, relatives, and even if you have some enemies and frenemies, send it to them too. Everybody needs God's word. It gives you an opportunity to share the word with others by forwarding the PDF along with the link to this video to those that you know that love God's word, love learning, and I would love, love, love for you to help us to share God's word. You can do that by getting the PDF, sending it to someone, having a discussion about it, because it does include personal discovery questions that will help you take a deeper dive into the scriptures, as well as liking the video, giving it a thumbs up, leaving a comment, and make sure that you do hit that bell notification so you'll be notified every time new content is loaded. And of course, you do know that we are live right here every Sunday morning at the 930 hour for our live worship experience. So I'm excited to welcome you to today's uh, video, and I pray that you'll be blessed by this week's teaching. So let's jump in as we welcome you to our study on Simon the Zealot, one of the lesser known disciples of Jesus Christ. While his name may not be as highly and widely recognized as some of the other disciples, Simon's journey from zealotry to redemption offers some profound lessons of faith, leadership, and transformation for us today. And of course, I'll explain what that whole concept of zealotry is as we go along in this week's teaching. But what we should understand as we delve into the life of Simon the Zealot is that we're going to discover how his encounter with Jesus made him into a faithful disciple and servant of the Lord. And you know, family, I want to tell you, it's our role in life to become faithful disciples and servants of the Lord. That's what I want for my life. How about you? Well, let's talk a little bit about the background and the profession of Simon the Zealot. He was also known as Simon the Canaan. And it is likely that he hailed from a place called Cana in Galilee. Of course, if you're a New Testament reader, then you're already aware that Cana rings a bell for you because this was the place, according to John chapter number two, where Jesus actually performed his very first miracle when he turned water into wine. So whether or not Simon was present at the wedding, we don't know. But what we do know is that being that he was from Cana at Galilee, he definitely had heard lots and lots of great stories about the miraculous power of the Savior. And it's likely that that may have been what actually kind of spurred faith in him to begin with. So why is he called Simon the Zealot? Why is he known as a zealot? And what on earth is a zealot? I hear you asking. I got the answer for you. Don't worry. I got you covered. (laughs) See, Simon is called a zealot because being a zealot was literally being a part of a movement that advocated for the overthrow of the Roman rule in Israel. And so as a zealot, 
Simon was actually a political activist who warred against the control of Rome over the people. Imagine that. One of Jesus' disciples was actually a political activist. He was actually one who was out there protesting and doing all sorts of things to try to overthrow the Roman government. Isn't it interesting how Jesus' disciples, all of them have an interesting background. Most of them have a very interesting background. But I think there's a great takeaway here for us, and I want you to miss this. And that is this, that the Lord will take your BC skills and use them as kingdom skills. So in the way that Simon was a zealot and uh, basically trying to help to advocate for people, even though he was trying to overthrow the Roman government, the Lord has a way of taking all of those things that we used in the world and somehow or another using it for the kingdom of God. He will allow you to use your skills to overthrow the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of Satan. You know, Jesus taught us to pray over there in Matthew chapter number six, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning Jesus wants us to be advocates for the kingdom of God, the rule of God over the lives of people, not the ways of this world. So in the same manner in which Simon was a zealot and was active politically in advocating for the overthrow of Roman rule in Israel, I think God has a way of choosing us specifically for specific assignments and yet using those skills and maybe some, even some of the adverse sides of us and using it for the kingdom of God to grow his kingdom. So this background actually suggests Simon's passion for his people and his desire to see political change, political change. And I think that we're living in a time now where we need to have a little bit more kingdom consciousness. And we want to see, we should want to see the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ in this world more than anything else. Let's look at the calling of this disciple, Simon the Zealot. Because despite his zeal, Jesus chose him. Even though he was a political activist, even though he was really anti-government, not even really about God, just anti-government, anti-politics, Jesus chose him anyway. And he calls him anyway. And let me show you in the scriptures where Simon the Zealot is called into the ministry of Jesus Christ. So we read in Luke chapter 6, verse number 13 through verse number 16, where it says, when morning came, he, that's Jesus, called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Now, I want you to make very close note of verse 14, because in this passage, you're going to see two Simons. There's a Simon in verse 14 and a Simon in verse 15. Pay close attention to verse 14 and verse 15. And verse 14 says, Simon, whom he named Peter. So we're talking about Simon Peter here. This is Simon Peter in verse number 14. And then his brother, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, verse 15, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, and here's the second Simon, Simon who was called the Zealot. So you can see the distinction there. And Simon the Zealot was his nickname because Jesus and the others wanted to distinguish him from Simon Peter. And of course, if you know about Peter, you might want to be distinguished from Peter. And isn't it good news to know that the Lord won't hold <laughs> the habits and hangups of others against you just because you're in the same boat with them. Isn't that a blessing? So this is a way to distinguish him from Simon Peter. He's called Simon the Zealot, reflecting his past in chasing, if you will, uh, the rights of the people to overthrow the Roman government. So 
Let's talk a little bit about the family of Simon the Zealot, because not a whole lot of details about Simon's family are explicitly mentioned in the scriptures. However, it is reasonable to assume that he had a family like many of the other disciples. His decision to follow Jesus likely had some implications for his family life. I mean, you can only imagine literally walking away from everything and everyone you know and love, walking away from the security of what you know and love in terms of your family, and then following Christ without a clear road map, without a clear direction as to where it is that you're headed and how you're going to get there. That took an incredible immense amount of faith to follow Jesus and to walk away from the surety and the certainty of what you have known all of your life. I want to look at some key moments this week in his ministry with Christ. So we find some very key moments in Simon Peter's ministry with Christ. I want to share with you. And here is the first one. He found fellowship with Jesus. Now, Simon experienced the privilege of walking alongside Jesus during his earthly ministry, witnessing his teachings and his miracles firsthand and interacting with the people that Jesus interacted with. But you know what, family? Simon the Zealot is not the only one with the privilege of walking with Jesus on a daily basis. You and I have the privilege of walking with him on a daily basis. It reminds me of the old hymn of the church. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Simon's privilege of walking with Jesus. Is something that you and I can experience, though not physically, spiritually. We walk with Jesus on a daily basis as we pray, as we worship, as we commune, as we share the Lord's Supper, we walk with Jesus. And that's a powerful, powerful key moment in his life. Here's another key moment in the life of Simon the Zealot, and that was learning and growth. As a disciple, Simon had the opportunity to learn directly from Jesus, deepening his understanding of God's kingdom and the true nature of discipleship. But guess what? You and I have the opportunity, the blessed privilege of learning and growing in Jesus. Because as we read his word, even as you listen to this teaching, this is an opportunity for growth. That's why you should always. Feed on the Word of God and feast on the Word of God because it is an opportunity for you to grow and to learn. Jesus even invites us in Matthew 11 and 28 Come unto me, all you that labor. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So it's an invitation to learn and to grow and to lean and depend on God. But there's another very vital key in his life. And that is unity among diversity. You see, Simon's inclusion in the group of disciples highlights Jesus' ability to bring together individuals from diverse backgrounds and ideologies. It emphasizes the unity that is found in following Christ. Family, the church is an avenue through which we experience unity and diversity. Because it is in the church that people gather from various walks of life, various places economically, background, ethically, socially, and all of the differences that we have yet is in the church that we experience unity and diversity. I believe God wants us all to be a part of the church and a part of the kingdom of God. But that means that you and I have to emphasize and embrace unity and diversity. Everybody's not going to be alike. Everybody's not going to think alike. Everybody's not going to act alike. But we can all be alike 
in the sense that we are unified as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And I believe with all my heart that that's what the Lord wants for every one of us. How about you? Don't forget, there is a free PDF linked in the description box below. Go get it, share it. Also like, share, and subscribe this video so that others may find this teaching. Don't forget to leave a comment. Let us know what speaks to you through these teachings. Well, let's look at some of the lessons that you and I can take away from the life of Simon the Zealot. And here's the first lesson. That is that we must embrace transformation. Embrace transformation. Now, just as Simon transitioned from zealotry to discipleship, you and I must have a transition in our lives as we encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to allow Christ to shape our hearts and our minds, guiding us from self-centered pursuits to kingdom-focused living. That's what he wants for you and me, kingdom-focused, kingdom-minded living. Question is, are you allowing him to transform your life? Because if you're not, you're not fulfilling his will. You're not walking in his way. You're not walking in his word. You're not walking in his purpose for your life. And so we need to understand that he wants us to experience and to embrace transformation. Here's another powerful takeaway, and that is that we are called to undergo transformation through our encounter with Jesus. If you're going to church and not changing, you're not going to church. You're just showing up at a building. You see, God wants transformation to happen in our lives. He wants us to be able to experience him in a powerful and real way. We need to manifest his glory in our worship, in our praise, in our personhood, in our personality, because he wants us to be transformed. Be transformed, Romans 12 and 2 says, by the renewing of your mind. So we have to embrace transformation. But also, we must be committed to learning, committed to learning. So we have to immerse ourselves in the teachings of Jesus and allow his words to shape our beliefs and our actions. Are you committed to learning of him? Remember, he says to us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me and learn of me. So being committed to learning means that I'm devoting time to hearing God's word, reading God's word, living God's word, practicing God's word, sharing God's word so that others who don't know God's word or who may not be as strong as I am in God's word can learn God's word and walk with God. I love this because we also learn the fact that we need to immerse ourselves. We need to take a deep dive, go deep into the teachings of Jesus and allow his words, literally, to shape the beliefs and the actions of our everyday lives. Family, we also need to pursue unity. Now, Simon's inclusion among the disciples reminds us of the importance of unity within the body of Christ. God wants us to seek unity as believers, regardless of our backgrounds or our differences or what class our work may be, because we are all supposed to be working together for the advancement of God's kingdom. Always remember, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. -S. Us has to be in Jesus. And if us is not in Jesus, it's not about anything at all. J-E-S-U-S. -S. And please notice, us is at the back, not at the front. So Jesus has to come before us. And us, as the old folks would say, us got to be in Jesus. I know that's bad grammar. But it is good gospel, though, isn't it? <laughs> Let me share with you some points to ponder from the life of our beloved disciple, Simon. 
As we seek unity amidst the diversity in our lives, we have to embrace fellow believers regardless of their background or their differences and work together again for the advancement of God's kingdom. That's what it is all about, saints of God. Let me share with you some points to ponder. I want to leave you with some thoughts this week that you can kind of hold on to, work your way through. And here's the first one. How does my own zeal for certain causes or ideologies align with God's kingdom purpose? Now, I want you to really think about that one because we all have zeal or another word for zeal is passion. We all have passion for pursuits and ideas and things that we love. But the question is, how does that align with God King, God's kingdom purposes? Do my passions align with God's kingdom purposes? And moreover, can God use my passions for kingdom purposes? That's a good question for us to ponder. And I want you to think about that this week. You will find that along with personal discovery questions in this week's handout that accompanies the teaching. And it's right down in the description box below. Let me share with you another powerful point to ponder this week. And that is, in what ways, in what ways am I allowing Jesus to transform my heart and mind to conform to his will? In what ways am I allowing Jesus to transform my heart and mind to conform to his will? You know, I've debated about that question. Maybe I should have changed it to, am I allowing? Am I allowing Jesus to transform my heart and mind to conform to his will? That's the question that I want you to ponder this week. Am I truly allowing the Lord to transform my heart and my mind? Or am I just staying the same? Am I remaining the same? Am I doing what I've always done? Or am I actually allowing Jesus to transform my heart and my mind to conform to his will. You see, that's exactly what Simon the Zealot did. He allowed Jesus to transform his heart and his mind to his will. That's what you and I must do, is to allow Jesus to transform our hearts and mind that we may indeed reflect the will of God in our lives. So I want to leave you with another thought to ponder this week. And here it is. How can I actively pursue unity and fellowship with fellow believers, even those with whom I may disagree? Woo! That's something to ponder. Isn't it? That's definitely something to think about. How, how, how can I be better at pursuing unity and fellowship with other believers, even those with whom I disagree? By the way, we're not going to always agree on everything. We don't have to, but we have to love through everything because church and the body of Christ and the kingdom of God is not about your opinion, your thoughts, your rationale, your reasoning. It's all about God's will and aligning with God's word. And if God's will is at play and God's word can clearly be seen, your opinion really doesn't matter, does it? Neither does mine. I'll tell you, man, I, I've just really enjoyed sharing these teachings with you. This has been part 11 of our series, Lessons from the 12 Disciples. Also, don't forget that you can acquire the free PDF handout in the description box below. Get it, share it, uh, go through those personal discovery questions to help you take a deeper dive into this week's teaching. Don't forget to go back and check out the other videos as well. Thank you so much for watching the Midweek Refill. I love sharing this with you. Pray that God will bless you. And don't forget to like, share, follow, and subscribe. And until next time, when we get to part 12 of Lessons from the 12 Disciples, you go with God.